AFR On Demand is brought to you by Breck Golf. Try Beaver Creek today, just 20 minutes from downtown Baton Rouge in the Zachary area. They've got a PGA Tour driving range, a short game practice area, 30 to 40 yard practice shots. It's a great place to chip and putt and practice if you don't have time for a full round. Book your tee time today, golf.breck.org, golf.breck.org. .com slash credit card. Matt Moscona. I'm very important. After further review. Say one more time. After further review with Matt Moscona. And here we go. Live from the Mercedes Benz of Baton Rouge studio. Let's ride! Number two, off we go. Welcome aboard. Glad you're with us. It's AFR, powered by Sunshine, your hometown John Deere dealer in Louisiana. I'm Matt. You're a loser, Matt! Hey, shut up, kid. Paul O'Neill. They're chanting Paul O'Neill's name. You sir. And Mr. Toby Tomplay. All right, we're here. Glad you are as well. Get out there and make it a good one. Bill Bender of the Sporting News in 13 minutes. Sean Salisbury next hour. We'll look forward to that. Saints uh, head into their bye week with a a little feel-good in the belly. After a seven-straight losing streak, seven-game losing streak, losing seven straight, you've won back-to-back games on your home field. You beat your rival, the Atlanta Falcons. You finish strong against the Cleveland Browns to win 35-14, run away and hide. And all the while, the division has kind of come back to you a little bit. Atlanta's hit the skids. They get blown out by Denver. The Bucs have lost four in a row. Oh, a lot of people right now are asking the question, you know, can the Saints maybe go on a run here and get back in the race and win the division and make the playoffs? I don't necessarily believe that's the case. The team that I would actually keep an eye on, they are the uh, not the Atlanta Falcons, but actually the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. If you look at Tankathon, str- uh, strongest remaining strength of schedule, uh, Atlanta has the 21st uh, most difficult remaining schedule. The Saints 25th, but Tampa 31st. Only Jacksonville plays an easier schedule the rest of the way. The only opponent the Bucs play the rest of the way with a winning record is the Chargers. Aside from that, they got the Giants, the Raiders, the Cowboys, the Panthers twice, and the Saints. So if you're looking for a team to make a run, it's probably Tampa. But all that said, it's hard to ignore what the Saints have done for two weeks under Darren Rizzi. And I'm not just talking about winning the game, but it's something we focused a good bit on. It's how they've won. The, the Atlanta game, you were thoroughly outplayed. You were outgained by 100 yards. You got doubled up on your rushing total. Um, but... You made winning plays. You blocked a field goal. You had the key turnover at two key turnovers in the fourth quarter, takeaways to seal that game. I could look at at the game against Cleveland. I mean, the game, the play that you got a big stop defensively on a fourth down early in the game. Then you turned that into a touchdown late in the game. Tie ball game, fourth quarter. You're at their 33 yard line. You could go line up for a 50 yard field goal to take the lead. Instead, you go for it on fourth and two, single wing, Taysom Hill, boom, 33-yard touchdown, place goes nuts, and then the Saints rolled from there the rest of the way. Darren Rizzi's pushed the right buttons. He's got buy-in, he's got belief, and it's pretty clear he's instituting good culture around that locker room right now, and not just in the locker room, but also in the city, and that's something Darren Rizzi said when he was uh, speaking to reporters on Monday about how he's kind of been received since being named interim head coach. Yeah, I can't stop by my favorite cheeseburger spot anymore on the way home. So, <laughs> no, it's it, people have been outstanding. I'm not out in public that often, as you can imagine. This is kind of this is where I am most of the time. But the few times that I've uh, I've stopped for gas or stopped for a cheeseburger or stopped you know on the way home or uh, you know certainly going to the Pelicans game the other night with my boys. The people of the city have been phenomenal and, and no surprise. So just uh, very very welcoming and and uh, really really cool, really awesome. And. There is a bit of an underdog mentality there. You know, Darren Rizzi, and I'm bringing this up because a lot of people are starting to ask the question about, 
is Darren Rizzi a, a candidate, a legitimate candidate for the full-time coaching job? Look, he's 54 years old, and he is a, a coaching lifer. You know, he became a coach as a GA back at Colgate in 1993, and we've run through his career. And the only time that he was a head coach was at New Haven from 1999 to 2001, and then for one season at Rhode Island in 2008. During his time in the NFL, starting in 2009, up until now, he's basically been a special teams guy. So, you know, for the Saints, I think there's two ways you kind of look at this. And I want to be very clear before I, I give you like a definitive answer and run through my take. Nobody should be making a definitive answer today. It's two games. You have a large sample the rest of the season on which you can judge Darren Rizzi because they're not going to win out. So how they handle a loss and that disappointment, you'll learn about it. Do they come back and play hard? Can they rebound from that? What's the culture and vibe continue to be like around the organization the rest of the way? So we'll get a bigger sample size of Darren Rizzi and we'll have a better, we'll have more information to be able to make a decision. It's like, it's like when you're dating someone, you don't propose to him on the first date or even the second date. I guess some of you do love at first sight, but for the most part, like there's a courtship and you learn about someone and you learn about their, their, their great benefits and their great, great character traits. And you learn about their flaws and you learn if you're compatible and all these different things. And so you'll have this courtship with Darren Rizzi now through the rest of the season. But when you're making a hire, it basically comes down to, if you're looking at Rizzi, are you looking for the coach or are you looking for culture? In the, in the perfect world, you could have both. But that's not always the case with, with head coaches. And sometimes you don't know it until they become a head coach. Like if I were to ask, who's the best coach? Like Muse Paul, like who would you say is the best head coach in the NFL right now? Currently, I'm not like Belichick's not coach. I'm talking like currently in the NFL is the best head coach. Andy Reid. Okay, Paulie. Andy Reid. Okay, is there a better example of culture? And by the way, a great offensive coach. No, you, you got them both. Yeah, right. That's that is bar none, not even a doubt. He's the best blend of both. A guy that his players love, and oh, by the way, he's also an awesome offensive mind, how creative he is in Kansas City. We talked a lot about Eric Bieniemy. You know, kind of riding sidecar side to, to, to Andy Reid. And with Bieniemy sort of leaving, remember he went to Washington, now he's at UCLA, and the whole thing was he needed to escape Andy Reid's shadow to prove he could be that guy as well. Well, Kansas City hasn't missed a beat. And I understand their offense isn't this year what it's been, but in large part, you could look at, at at injuries as as a massive component to what's happened there. Well, after Andy Reid, if I said, okay, well, guys, like, what? Who else would you put on that list? Like, so Andy Reid, best coaches in the NFL, Sean McDermott, Sean McDermott. Okay, Sean McDermott. It's weird, man. Some people thought he'd been fired. Yeah. And they don't make a run this year, but yeah, I would say John Harbaugh. John Harbaugh, John Harbaugh. I agree with that. Yeah. Any uh, others? McVay. Sean McVay. Sean McVay. Like these are all these are all right. These are on the short list of what everybody says. It's not a trick question. Anybody else? Kyle Shanahan? Yeah, Shanahan. Everyone always mentions Shanahan. Mike Tomlin? Oh, God, I'm mad at myself for not mentioning Mike T, actually. There's there's one that you haven't mentioned that I, I hoped you would. It's Dan Campbell. Yeah. Because Dan Campbell is probably the best example of what you hope Darren Rizzi could be. See, there's two ways to look at this when you're making a hire. Yes, you want to blend coach and culture. If you can get Andy Reid, that's both. That's awesome. But the reason you go for the great coach, either offensively or defensively, is you don't concern yourself as much with turnover on your staff. When you're Bill Belichick and you're one of the greatest defensive minds ever, you're going to churn through coordinators in New England. It happened. It was Romeo Cronell and it was Eric Mangini. And there was this long list of coaches that came through and they got plucked away because people wanted a little piece of that magic, whatever it was. Look at what's happening right now in San Francisco with, Mc, with, uh, with Shanahan or in L.A. with McVeigh. People want to pluck branches from that tree to steal some of that. If it's Ben Johnson, it, you know, if it's uh, Kevin O'Connell, look around the league. Mike McDaniel. People are trying to, it's a copycat league. You want little pieces of those branches. But because you've got Shanahan and McVay, you're not worried about losing the coordinator because you still got the puppet master. So your offense, in theory, shouldn't miss a beat. So that's kind of where I think if you're the Saints, where you are right now, you look and say, okay, and this is what I've advocated for them doing. 
saying, okay, go get the guy off of that Shanahan McVay tree. You just hired a defensive coach, or an NFL retread. You know, you, you hired from within, and it didn't work. So why would you, again, hire from within, veteran guy, not an offensive coach? Like, go the other way. Go the opposite of what you just did. Go hire the young offensive mind. Like I've told you, my number one choice is Ben Johnson. That's, but that's the guy everybody wants, and I don't think the Saints are going to be the most attractive job for him um, when he has offers that no doubt will come for him this offseason. But I look at, at Campbell, and I can't help but think, like, could you have promoted Dan Campbell and ultimately had him here? But I rewind the clock, and a lot of people are saying the same thing about Aaron Cromer, who was your offensive line coach. He was kind of like the next big thing. He served as an interim during the Pounty Gate year, ultimately got an opportunity there with the Bears, and it, it didn't work out for him. But I will point out, there are examples of successful coaches that aren't the, the coordinator, the puppet master offensively or defensively. We just mentioned Dan Campbell. I mean, Dan Campbell played tight end, and he was an interim in Miami. When Flores got axed, he was an interim in Miami, and he could have gotten that job, and they passed on him. Detroit hired him, and clearly the thing he has done there has brought culture. Now, the long-term question about Campbell is what happens when you inevitably lose your two coordinators? Because Ben Johnson and Aaron Glenn are going to get head coaching jobs. So are you able to replace them? One guy that's been able to do it very successfully is John Harbaugh, who Muse mentioned, which is a great comp as well. Harbaugh, John Harbaugh, was a special teams coach, by the way, as well. So he's a guy who's instilled great culture, great stability in that organization for two decades now, and he's been able to hire replacement coordinators when his guys have either retired or gotten plucked away. So there is a, a blueprint that says it's possible. It's possible to win consistently, to win big, to maintain stability with a coach that isn't the play caller. And maybe the most important thing on top of being the offensive genius or whatever it may be is building culture. It's a chicken or the egg question. What do you want? Do you want the play caller or the culture? Does, does the play calling beget winning, which builds culture? Or do you build culture first, which then begets winning? And I don't know the answer to that. There's different ways to skin a cat. But for me, I'm looking at reducing risk. How can you reduce risk and potentially have the biggest payoff? I still think, no matter what, if it's Rizzi or if it's Ben Johnson or one of those coordinators, if you're hiring a first-time head coach, there's tremendous risk. The question is, what do you want? Do you want the culture first, or do you want the great play caller? Ideally, you get both. But if you hire Darren Rizzi, you're getting one without the other. And you're hoping the culture builds and and continues to 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 grow, and that it makes you more attractive to free agents and other great coaches that want to be part of your organization. But the opposite can also be true. You could hire Darren Rizzi, and he could whiff on coordinator hires, and you could not be very good because this is still a roster that's going to go through some growing pains. Because you're going to get younger and you're going to get less expensive as you go through this cap situation. So can you hire someone with great culture? that's willing to go through that. and Maybe Darren Rizzi is that guy. My choice still today is to go get a guy like Ben Johnson, if you can. But if the top guys like that aren't available, maybe a guy like Darren Rizzi becomes more attractive. The big thing that gives me pause, while, I, while clearly the players love him and culture matters so much, the big thing that makes me wonder is continuing to to latch on to the Peyton, Breeze, Dennis Allen. You just continue to perpetuate this era that is over. And for me, I have this strong feeling that I would rather see them just uproot everything from this era and start over. And that's unfair to Darren Rizzi. Certainly it's unfair to Darren Rizzi because he can be his own man, his own coach, run his own organization. But he is also part of this. Maybe... Over the next two months, he can wash the stains of that era off of him and maybe make a very compelling case to be the full-time head coach. We'll continue to follow it. 
Let me know your thoughts if you got them. You can email us, tweet us, text us, 225-396-4400-396-4400. I'm late. We'll get to Bill Bender next, AFR. After further review. I had a great lunch meeting today with my friends over at Action Industries. Proud partner of LSU Athletics. Got to sit down with Chuck and Chad and Jordan and Erica, their marketing director, And we talked about the Advanced Turnaround Group. So you've heard me talk about Action Industries for a year now. And one of the things that I want to make sure that I've spent a lot of time hammering is the Advanced Turnaround Group, which is a part of Action Industries. They've assembled a core group that have built their careers on turnaround execution. They're not just taking any worker in their business and throwing them in in the turnaround world. These are people, part of the Action Industries advanced turnaround group, that that is what they do. It's turnarounds. So you need people to get in, get your turnaround work done. Of course, with the highest safety standards and great quality, you want Action Industries and their advanced turnaround group. Check them out. It's Action Industries. After further review, powered by Sunshine, your hometown, John Deere dealer in Louisiana. She thinks my tractor's sexy. Two more weeks of college football's regular season. They'll get the championship weekend as well. Then we'll know who will be in the original, the inaugural, I should say, 12-team college football playoff. Bill Bender, good enough to join us for a couple of minutes here to chat about all of it. He's on uh, Twitter at BillBender92. Y'all give him a follow. Hey, Bill, we appreciate the time as always, man. How are you? Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for having me on. Uh, No, it's our pleasure. Is there anything through, uh, I guess, 12 weeks of the regular season now, going into week 13, um, that has uh, maybe overtly surprised you from what you thought back in, in August when we were sitting there at week zero? Oh, it's more of a mess than I thought it would be. Okay. Um, you know, I thought, well, there's not a, an untouchable team. I'll put it that way. You know, I'm so used over the last 10 years, and as you know, I live in Big Ten country, that you would say, okay, Ohio State's untouchable, or Georgia or Alabama is untouchable. Last year it was Michigan. I I feel like any one of these, there's eight or nine teams to me that could win the national championship. And I don't, I've been doing this for a while. It's been a while since the list is that high. Do you think, uh, do you attribute that to the, the portal NIL culture? Or do you think this is just a, a weird one-off? I think it's a weird year in some ways because Alabama's obviously got a new coach. Georgia lost a lot of guys. Michigan has a new coach. Um, Ohio State's probably the closest thing. You know, I don't know they lost on the road at Oregon by one point, but with the additions they've made in elite defense, uh, playing in three top five showdowns, uh, they they feel like that. And I've had moments where I've felt that way individually about Georgia or Alabama or Texas, and then I have to change my mind 15 minutes later because that SEC is just so darn competitive. How do you make um, make sense out of the SEC where you have just this big log jam where it's a bunch of two lost teams that have all just sort of cannibalized each other? Well, I mean, it's fun. That's what the NFL does. I mean, you substitute the AFC for the F- 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 <laughs> NFC, AFC, NFC, SEC. I'll get it right eventually. Yeah. And it's the same concept. I mean, I love watching Green Bay every Sunday. And I and the acceptance of, hey, if that bear field goal goes in, the sun comes up the next day and they're fine. Yeah. You know, they're still in the playoff hunt. And I think... You're figuring that out in the SEC. I, I, I did take to heart what Kirby said, though. Those environments in the SEC are hard to win at, maybe harder than anywhere else in the country, especially when you have to do it week in and week out. So what about uh, in the Big Ten, where you are? Uh, the giant game of the weekend is undefeated Indiana going to 9-1 and Ohio State. And this will, I think we've all talked about it a bunch, Bill, is be the first ranked team Indiana will have faced. So... First of all, the game itself, how much of a shot do you give the Hoosiers as a two-touchdown underdog going into the into the shoe? Man, I live in the Ohio bubble, and so it's hard for me to separate from that when I just typed this in for my reaction tonight that last time Indiana beat Ohio State, uh, Don't Worry But Be Happy was the top song in the country. <laughs> I mean, What year was it? Bobby McFerrin, what year was that? 1988, okay. so it's been a minute. Yeah. So, there's that establishment feeling here that it's like, okay, I'll believe it when you, you beat Ohio State, you know, or you compete with Ohio State for four quarters. I mean, they beat Michigan. I get that. But I would make the argument that if Michigan had a quarterback, they'd probably win that game, uh, mm-hmm. you know, especially the way they played in the second half. But 
So it comes down to this. I think what's going to happen at the end of the rainbow is we're going to have a one-loss Indiana team arguing with either a two-loss Tennessee or two-loss Ole Miss team for that final spot. Or uh-huh. even possibly the, the SEC championship game loser. Although I feel, and I, I'm thinking you do too, if you go to the SEC championship game, I don't think you should be penalized for that third loss. Bill, I agree with you, but I saw undefeated Georgia last year lose the SEC championship game and get knocked out of a four-team playoff when they were the back-to-back defending national champions and were wire-to-wire number one last year. I think the committee is going to do whatever is the path of least resistance. So I, I've given up trying to make sense of what they, they might do. Um, let me ask you your opinion. Not necessarily what, what you think the committee would do. What would you do? If, if Indiana loses to Ohio State and, and they finish 11-1 and one without, a, a, without a marquee win, would you still put them in? I would if they keep it competitive Saturday. If they get beat 42-7, to seven, I would probably... I, and here's the... I just had this conversation in a, uh, a, one of our meetings at Sporting News, and I was shunned a little bit. I said... <laughs> I would put a two, if the final argument was two lost Tennessee and one lost Indiana, and Indiana gets beat 42 to seven on Saturday and it's not competitive at all, if it looks like Ohio State Northwestern, I would probably put Tennessee in. If Indiana competes, I'll give, I get that they don't have a marquee victory. You can only play your schedule. Most of us, I don't think there's anybody in SEC country that thinks Ole Miss, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, or even Texas A&M would lose to Indiana. Yeah, I I would agree with that. But that's all. Why, also, why it's fun to play the games and uh, and you see how they all play out. But so then the same question though, Bill, is extended to Texas because they're nine and one, but they don't have a marquee win either. They will have the opportunity against Texas A&M. But what do you do with Texas? Oh, I, I watched them go up to Michigan and dominate them. So I don't think it's a head to head with Indiana. I mean, I, I watched Texas. Beat Michigan pretty good. I, I get your point, though. If they lose that A&M game, it's kind of like, okay, so who did you beat? And again, we're at the mercy of a schedule that a couple things need reevaluated here. It's like, should we go back to divisions? Should we go back to a, like a pod system? You know, if I was the SEC, I wouldn't be opposed to four four-team divisions. That way you guarantee, you know, because they could split it up. I think you and I could figure that out and split it up so you have at least two marquee opponents each year. Um, so you don't get fall into what happened with Texas. I mean, it's not their fault that uh, some of these teams that they play are bad, but at the same time, you got you got to look at the schedule the way you play it. Then there wouldn't be that imbalance that we have between a Texas schedule and a Florida schedule. Hey, Bill, it's so funny. We were there in Dallas at SEC Football Media Days, and that was one of the giant narratives of the entire week was Texas is probably going to be in the SEC championship game because who do they play? It's almost as if the SEC schedule makers went to them with a blank sheet of paper and said, here, who do you want to play <laughs> this fill year? Fill that out. I mean, that it, out. You have Oklahoma. Fill the rest out on your own and just make sure Georgia or Alabama's on there. That's what they felt like they did. That's kind of what it feels like. Uh, Bill Bender, Sporting News. Um, Bill, what do you – it makes sense of the Big 12 for me. I can't. Um, I can kind of uh, – I think Colorado is going to win it. I think they're the best team in the Big 12 right now. They've won their last four games by 18 points per game. They, they, they have the two best players on the field in the Big 12 when they step on the field in every game. I think they're going to take care of business against Kansas. The, the BYU loss, I stay up and watch these BYU games. They're fun. They're fun to watch, though. I, I know they're not dominant. I understand that. But there's something about a team pulling out a bunch of close wins. And, you know, obviously the ball bounced the other way against Kansas. So, I think it will be the winner of the BYU Arizona State game. Arizona State, another team playing really good football yeah. in that conference. But I just feel, and I know you guys have the high school ball down there, and it's not meant to be a slight, but it's going to sound like one anyway. I just feel like when you watch the SEC and the Big Ten, you're watching the biggest division of high school football, and then the next, the ACC and the Big Twelve, is that second division. Yeah, I mean that's I I think huh, I think conference realignment has made it that way. <laughs> I mean, both of these leagues have taken the best teams from other leagues and weakened them and then propped up their leagues. I think that's that's undeniable. A couple more minutes here with Bill Bender. Um, okay, so what do you do with Notre Dame, assuming they, they beat Army and Southern Cal 
go 11 and one, but the one is a hideous one. What do you do? It's a bad one, but I, I think they will make it in. They've played pretty well the last month, and granted, they're doing it beating on ACC teams, which, you know, they don't have a signature victory. Again, but it's not their fault. They didn't anticipate that Florida State would be that bad or that uh, USC would be four and five. And any given year, you'd look at that schedule and say, wow, and yeah. that's tough. Um, or that they're not playing the other Big Ten powers. But I, I think they're in at 11-1. and one. I actually like their defense a lot, and I'm interested to see how that Notre Dame defense, which has been, even in the Northern Illinois game, played very well, play against some of these SEC schools. One of the things we're going to find out in the playoffs, if you look at the top 10 scoring defenses in the country, eight of them are projected to play. So we're mm-hmm. going to have – some lower, I, it's just my way of saying I think we're going to have some lower scoring games in the playoff than we're used to seeing. Huh. In an era of offense, 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 apparently maybe it still is uh, the old adage about defense winning championships. Um, okay, Bill, before you go, I, I'd love a thought. We're here, obviously, in Baton Rouge and all over Louisiana. Um, I'd love a thought on LSU, and in particular, you know, when when Brian Kelly came here, I, I, I knew, I mean, I knew Brian Kelly from afar because he was the coach at Notre Dame, but didn't know anything about him. You being there in the Midwest, no doubt covering the sport nationally, knowing Brian Kelly during his time at, at Notre Dame. I'm curious what you make of what's happened to LSU from a team that three weeks ago was in the top ten and poised to make a playoff run. The collapse at A and M happens, and the wheels have come off. Um, here's your thoughts of what's going on here in Baton Rouge. Now they've changed since halftime of that A and M game. It's crazy. At halftime of A and M, I had something very different written about Nussmeyer and how this team was a threat to win the SEC. I think the penalties have caught up. The you know you hear about discipline and those kind of things, and I you know this as well as I do. Fit matters um, in college football with a coach, with a quarterback, with any of that. I mean, you guys won your last national championship with a, a guy from my neck of the woods up here in Ohio named Burrow. That wasn't too bad, but it's yeah. because he fit into the system they were doing. And, you know, for Brian Kelly, he's going to have to find that fit. I don't think you fire him. I I know he can win football games, but the balance of what we see on social media that goes viral with him very quickly versus the results on the field, there's no way LSU should have four losses, in my opinion. You know, it's... uh... It's going to be. By the way, Bill, there's no way they fire him. His his buyout. He. I mean, it's. He he's owed ninety percent of the balance of his contract. It would be almost seventy million dollars, and LSU's just not paying that. So, the way I've said it for since they hired him, for better or worse, you are financially bound to Brian Kelly and he to you for a decade. So you better make it work. Um, man, it was looking good until about three weeks ago. Uh, Bill Bender, Sporting News at Bill Bender ninety two. Y'all give him a follow. We appreciate it, Bill. Thanks for the time as always, man. Anytime. You guys enjoy. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, man. Be well. It is after further review brought to you by Optimize, GeneratorPeople.com, GeneratorPeople.com. Hey, if you're thinking about a Generac Automatic Home Standby Generator, what an awesome time to do it now before the new year. Call Optimize or go to GeneratorPeople.com. Listen, I say it all the time. It's not if, but when. It's not if the power goes out, it's when. Well, when the inevitable happens and the power goes out, are you prepared? Well, if you call Optimize and have a Generac Automatic Home Standby Generator installed, you will be. Power goes out, boom. Your entire home powers back on as soon as your Generac Automatic Home Standby Generator kicks in. It takes about 15 to 30 seconds, and then everything is on. Your HVAC unit, even your pool, everything. It's like nothing ever even happened. Remember, a generator is a commodity. A lot of people, a lot of businesses sell the same product. So why is Optimize Louisiana's number one Generac dealer? It's easy. It's the only thing they do. They sell, service, and install Generac Automatic Home Standby Generators. So they have it perfected. All their technicians, that's all they do all day is work on these generators. Not an HVAC company that also does generators. They're not an electrical company that also does generators. They're generator people. So go to generatorpeople.com, generatorpeople.com. All right, it's after further review. Tuesday show is powered by Sunshine, your hometown John Deere dealer in Louisiana. Thanks to Bill Bender. Uh, Shay Dixon was here last hour. If you missed our conversation with Shea, uh, the early signing period is two weeks from tomorrow. We went deep dive into LSU's recruiting class. You can catch that on demand if you missed it. Sean Salisbury in 30 minutes from right now. When we come back, um, Marquez valdez Scantley been a very pleasant surprise for the New Orleans Saints. So what do they do with him long term? We'll talk about it next. Say far. After further review. Get Gordon and get it done. Gordon McKernan, injury attorneys. Go to getgordon.com, getgordon.com. Actually, go to gordongives.com. Been telling you about it. 
And right now, the registration is open for the Gordon Gives bike giveaway. Every year around Christmas here in the holiday time, Gordon shares this story, one of his favorite. It's actually there on the website at gordongives.com. You can read it. One of his favorite memories, he always tells the story, Christmas morning was waking up and having a red Schwinn bicycle. So he wants to extend that joy to less fortunate kiddos in our state. So children all across Louisiana are encouraged to enter. Um, you can see the giveaway dates, times, all that stuff right there on the website. Go to gordongives.com, gordongives.com. Just fill out that form right there. Remember, 488 bicycles. Gordon's giving away 488 bicycles to children in communities all across Louisiana. What an awesome thing to do. You know what to do. Get Gordon and get it done. After further review, powered by Sunshine, your hometown John Deere dealer in Louisiana. All right, Sean Salisbury coming up about 25 minutes from right now. Saints head into their bye uh, when they come back. Look forward to seeing Marquez Valdez-Scantling back on the field. What an impact he's made. Six catches, three of them deep touchdowns. Been pretty awesome to see. Um, uh, Muse, you ran this by me today and said, you know, what do they do with with Valdez-Scantling? What prompted that? That made you want to think about that? Well, just mainly because... I mean, it's wild the success he's had immediately with Derek Carr on the field. You're pretty much tied to Carr for at least one more year. He's a free agent. He is 30 years old. But culture, he's a culture fit in the locker room, guy who's been on Super Bowl uh, teams, and a veteran presence who immediately is just coming and, and fit so, so well. But, but there was nothing that prompted this. Like, nothing happened that made you think, like, what do they do with about Marquez Valdez-Scantling? Like, you didn't see a news story or anything? No. I okay, just, just about what they yeah. did. Yeah. So... Um, here's the interesting thing. I, I think you were asking it like, do they sign him to a long-term deal? What would you say is a, what would you define as a long-term deal? Three years. So I think there's zero shot he gets a three-year contract. Um, a, a couple reasons. First of all, that you mentioned, he's 30. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to give a three-year deal to, to someone who is on a kind of a, a, Plug and play deal right now. Who was on the street? If you're going to offer someone a three year contract, it, there's going to be a there's going to be competition. Is there any competition for Marcos Valdez Scanling? Well, that's what I think is going to be really interesting to see because, like you said, he's on the street. People didn't think he could play. Now they see him playing as well as he is, even at thirty. I think he could get some competition, but I don't know what it, how how heavy that competition is. If that makes sense. Yeah, I don't think there's anybody willing to offer him that type of deal is the point. So so I, I went and looked up his deals. So he had his rookie deal in Green Bay. Then he signed a three-year, $30 million contract in Kansas City. That contract was supposed to run him through 2024, but they cut him. So they cut him entering the final year of that contract. And that's a guy who'd been on two Super Bowl teams yeah. with them now. So they cut him entering this year. He goes to Buffalo. He had signed a... The deal that he had signed with Buffalo was a one-year deal worth two and a quarter. So I would argue before this season, he had great value, right? He's on the team with Mahomes. They win back-to-back -back Super Bowls. But Kansas City didn't re-sign him, and he only had a one-year deal. Basically, basically think of it in the same terms as, like, Willie Gay, right? Yeah. The, the Saints were able to sign him to a one-year prove-it deal. Or, or Chase Young different because he had battled injuries, but a one-year prove-it deal. So if that's all he got, and then not even halfway through the season, Buffalo cans him, and he's sitting on the street. The Saints have the injury to Shahid. They sign him. I, it, there's a big difference whenever there's a market for a player and then teams clamor for him. If there was a market for him, Buffalo would have cut him. They would have traded him. So I don't think there's really a market for Marquez Valdez-Scantling beyond what he is. The real question, I think, is this. He and Rashid Shahid are essentially the same player, right? Essentially, yes. They're both your stretch-the-field deep threat. So the Saints signed Shahid to a two-year deal, but the second year is voided. Basically, they did that just to spread cap money. Because, of course, they did. You're right, yeah. Checks out. So it was like a one-year... I had it here. It's one year... Uh, one point... Did I do this right? One year, $5.2 million deal where they could spread the cap hit. So like 
four and a quarter or four point four five go into next year because of what whatever. So the point is, Shahid's going to be on the team next year. I'm pretty confident of that because of yeah, because of the contract. So, do you have room for Shahid and for Marcos Valdez Scantling? And if you do, what does that deal look like for Scantling? So the the deal Buffalo did for him was one year, two and a quarter million. Now um, MVS is with the Saints at one year. It's like one and a quarter. Um, That's what it is. One and a quarter. One, no, one point one two five. One point one. Okay, so one point one two five. So if I could sign Marcos Valdez Scantling for twenty twenty five on that deal, one year, one, let's call it one and a quarter. Let's give let's give him the extra uh, the extra ten k. <laughs> um, like or or well, I guess eighty. Okay, I, give him another hundred grand. Whatever. Um, yeah, I would do that. Clearly, he's proven worth there. But what I don't want to do at all, and this isn't just with Marcos Valdez Scantling, this is with every deal the Saints do. I do not want to sign old players, expensive players to long term deals. Like you just can't do that anymore. You've completely screwed your salary cap situation by doing things like this. So I'm thrilled with him through two games. Been awesome, man. Clearly still has wheels, can stretch the field, but so can Shahid. And when Shahid was healthy and Carr were healthy, like that was the combination early in the season. So you've got Shahid under contract. You, I, He's younger. He'll be here next year. I mean, I think... If Marcos Valdez-Scantling plays his way into the market and there is competition for him, he can get a better deal somewhere else, good for him. I just don't know that that market's going to be there for 30. You said he'll be 31 when? I mean, he'll be 31 to the start of next year. October. Next season, excuse me. So October, he turned 30 on October the 10th. So, so he'll turn 31 in October. Like week five. Yeah. You know? So I don't know, man. Like I just, I look at, at him, I'm thrilled with the production you've gotten. I think it's a very pleasant surprise. I don't think any of us oh, thought sure. it would be this, uh, where he has been such an incredible deep threat. But I also look and I go, what I want the New Orleans Saints to do is go find me another Rashid Shahid. Go find me another undrafted rookie free agent that's going to be dirt cheap that you can get reps out of. And you know what? They're not going to win big be, with, with a guy like that because you're not going to win big. You just have to accept the fact that this is what you are right now until you can fix your cap situation to where you can be competitive in free agency. But most importantly, man, you got to hit in the draft. You just, like you've, you traded Lattimore. You got more draft capital. You're got, I'm assuming you're going to get more draft capital as well as we see with the compensatory picks uh, come along and how that happens. But you, you've got to make the most out of your draft capital and hit in this draft so you can get younger and more affordable as opposed to getting older and more expensive. It, it was why I didn't like the Kamara deal. It, it's not that I don't love Alvin Kamara. I love Alvin Kamara. He's amazing. He shows you he's still got something left in the tank. But you extended a 30-year-old running back for three years. and or, or two years. Like, that's the problem I have. Like, you, you got older and more expensive. When, inherently, you need to get younger and more affordable. So, you want to bring Marcos Valdez scaling on a one-year deal at... One point, well, at one and a quarter, come on. I'm all for it. Anything beyond that, I don't know. Do you disagree? Do you, you give him no, a longer-term well, no, deal? No, no, no. That's the thing. I, I actually don't. Uh, I, I don't disagree with you at all. I They need to get younger. They've started to already try to get younger. The thing was that I found so interesting was just the scenario around him. Because I think if he plays, continues on this trajectory he's on, that there will be at least some type of market for him. Maybe not three years. You just asked me what I would consider long-term, so mm -hmm. I gave you three yeah. years. Mm -hmm. um, mm -mm. But, I, so the, just the, because you've been looking so hard for a number three option, the scenario around him is interesting. Did you stumble into one? It's kind of what prompted it, to go back to your original question. Maybe the bigger question is what happens with Chris Olave. Yeah. Is his career over? And I, I don't want to be presumptive. I'm not saying it is. But there's at least a conversation around a guy that has this concussion history who's now, it sounds like, going to be shut down for the rest of the year. What, what is his future? And that may be a bigger question that you address in the draft and with other assets as you move into to 2025. All right, it's after further review. brought to you by Parish Construction and Roofing, also Parish Restoration. I tell you every day, do business with someone you know. That's me, that's Terrio, that's Richard Tilly, that's Joe Morales, it's Trent Davis, the five of us uh, partners in Parish Construction and Roofing, but also... 
Our guy Jim Woodworth, who we partnered with over at Parish Restoration, told you forever about Mold Zero. Well, Parish Restoration, same thing. We're just all under the Parish umbrella now. So go to parishbuilt.com. The, the best thing I can tell you about working with Parish, aside from doing business with someone you know, that we're local and we're people here and you can reach us and we're accountable, we're not an out-of-state company. We're not. We're very public with who who the the owners and managers are in, in this company. You know where to reach me. But you can deal with one contractor. So if you have an issue with your roof, and let's say there's water intrusion, and so now you need help with decking, or you have an electrical issue, or you have mold and you need remediation, you could do it all with one contractor. Us, Parish Construction Roofing. Instead of calling five different contractors and then trying to coordinate schedules, you can deal with one contractor, and it's all in house. This we're not subbing out work. It's all in-house at Parish Construction Roofing. So go to parishbuilt.com. We'd love to give you the free, no-obligation roofing inspection, commercial or residential. We have our maintenance program as well that can help extend the life of your commercial roof instead of the, the very costly full roof replacement. we got a solution for basically anything you've got going on under that roof. Parish Construction and Roofing. Parishbuilt.com. Parishbuilt.com. Okay, let me knock out our final break here of hour number two. Sean Salisbury in about 15 minutes from right now. We'll come back. Muse will have Tigers in the pros. LSU basketball back on the hardwood tonight. A Matt McMahon squad taking on Charleston Southern. We'll get you a thumbnail preview of that next hour as well. Otter Locks already live over at LouisianaSports.net. If you want to get Otter's picks, if you don't want to wait an hour for them, you can get them right now at LouisianaSports.net. All right, wrap up hour number two next on AFR. AFR. Y'all, if you were thinking about slapping that for sale by owner sign in your front yard, stop. I want to remind you, 73% of people that list their home for sale by owner end up hiring a realtor. Could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe you're not sure how to price your home. Maybe you're unfamiliar with the paperwork. Maybe you can't be home for showings all the time. Whatever it may be. Save yourself the time and the money. You want an enjoyable home buying or home selling experience? You need Darren James. You want an experience that's going to get the best results fast? You want Darren James. Agent225.com, agent225.com. Buying or selling, you need Darren James. Wall Street Journal's Real Trends list of the top 1% of realtors in America, number one in Louisiana. Think Darren James. After further review, powered by Sunshine, your hometown John Deere dealer in Louisiana. All right, wrapping up hour number two, Muso Tigers in the pros. Tigers in the pros. They still bleed purple and gold. They're just really rich now. All right, so yesterday, as we were on air, really to start the 5 o'clock hour, told you Paul Skeens was named the 2024 National League Rookie of the Year. Some context behind that. Skeens is the second Rookie of the Year in LSU baseball history. Joins Alvin Dark, who won the award back in 1948. Since the live ball era, so 1920, no pitcher, no rookie pitcher, I should say, has made as many starts as Skeens at 23 and had a lower ERA of 1.96. He rewrote the record books, led the National League amongst pitchers with at least 130 innings in ERA, strikeouts per nine, walks, and hits per nine innings as well. Just the latest chapter in a uh, fantastic year or so that Paul Skeens uh, has authored for himself. NFL football last night. Uh, if you watched Monday Night Football, boy, you couldn't help but notice Derek Stingley Jr. He was all over the place for the Houston Texans. Two stops, an interception. He, he, he could have had about two or three more interceptions in the game, quite honestly. How about this uh, for Stingley, courtesy of Next Gen Stats. While guarding Devontae Adams, Garrett Wilson, C.D. Lamb, Mike Williams, and D.J. Moore this year, 17 targets, 95 yards, the two picks, and just five uh, just five pass breakups as if there well. was an OPI on C.D. Lamb in the end zone, or Singley would have had another pick. Yeah, and he could have had another one off of that while also guarding. He could have had at least three interceptions last night. He was awesome. Uh, Daniel Hunter racked up two sacks and yeah, three tackles for a loss in that one as well. Tari Eason just missing a double-double last night. Nine points. Excuse me, nine points, 14 rebounds. That's Tigers in the Press. Presented by Lee Michaels Fine Jewelry, LMFJ.com, LMFJ.com for Lee Michaels Fine Jewelry. Gents, 
If you're thinking of popping the question, you know where to go. Where all of Louisiana has gone for 40 years to get engaged. Lee Michaels Fine Jewelry. With nine locations, there's a location near you. And of course, when you're buying for nine locations, you'll have a great selection and you can offer great prices to your customers. Pass on the, the cookie cutter big box store. Of course, the boutique jewelers, you're just not going to get the selection and you're going to overpay. Lee Michaels is the perfect, just right fit. Selection and great price and always the Lee Michaels experience. LMFJ.com. Thrill her with a gift in the red box from Lee Michaels Fine Jewelry. Um, Pelicans are on the floor tonight against Dallas. Do we reinstate the Christmas music thing with the Pelicans? We might have to do that. I mean, not until they win games, or do we just not talk about them at all? I mean, that's the thing. Sad. Get I mean, healthy, maybe yeah. we'll talk about you. Maybe, 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 maybe not. Maybe. AFR. All right, Sean Salisbury is coming up right after Sports Center. We are brought to you by the Williamson Eye Center. Popped over to Williamson last week. Sat down with Amber, the marketing director, Kyle, who's the. When I tell you all the time, uh, to to go for that free. That no obligation consultation. You'll meet with with Kyle, and Kyle will ask you questions. Very easy. I mean, this is a maximum, ma- like max thirty minute conversation, and you don't even have to go in. You can do the con the consultation virtually, and she'll let you know what, based on your history, you might be a candidate for, and then you decide if you want to proceed. Then you can go meet Dr. Blake, and then you, then you can make your decision if you want to proceed. With, uh, with a refractive procedure. But the thing that I got to tell you, I mean, for most people, you'd love to be able to have a refractive procedure and ditch the contacts and glasses forever. They have financing options, 24 months, 0% deferred interest. Never let that be an impediment. The Williamson Eye Center. 